Kia ora koutou katoa no mai, hara mai. Welcome to another Tohi Caucus webinar. Um, before, as we're getting started, um, everyone's trickling in slowly to our virtual space. Um, find yourselves a comfortable spot to sit in for this hour and we'll start off with a karakia. Whakataka te hau ki te uru, whakataka te hau ki te tonga, ki a mā kina kina ki uta, ki a mā tara tara ki tai, e hi a ke ana te atakura, he tio, he huka, he hau hu, ti hei mauri ora. Ki ora and welcome to this um, space. We're acknowledging all of you who have joined us, all of the Indigenous lands where I'm broadcasting on, where our wonderful presenters are joining us from and where all of you are logging in from today. Um, just a, our usual little virtual housekeeping before we get going today. Um, we are going to be here for an hour. The, this session is being recorded so you'll be able to access it afterwards and if anyone missed it for whatever reason they'll be able to um, go back to it and review it and also the PowerPoint slides will be made available afterwards. Down on the bottom navigation pane there's a few different icons just to familiarize yourself with. One of them is the speech bubble icon which is the chat so let us know straight away who you are and where you're from. Um, in the chat it automatically just um, texts us three um, so you need to select all panellists and attendees and then you'll be able to talk to everyone. So chat in, let us know who you are and where you're from. Um, the other way you can get our attention is through the Q&A box and that is um, the Q&A, um, the two speech bubbles with the Q&A and um, that's the way you can ask questions to the panellists. We will be going for a few um, there'll be a mostly a presentation to begin with from Tanya and Debbie, and then we'll have a quite a good discussion at the end. So also if you have some specific um, questions that you or things that you want to evaluate um, in your work, um, please get it through. So we've got quite a few coming in at the moment. Lots of you are just texting us. So if you do want to text everyone, go all panelists and attendees, and we've got people from Auckland, Otago, Hawaii, um, lots of people from all over. So um, also for the people that pop your hand up, we don't really look at the hands. Um, the best way to get our attention is through the chat and the Q&A box. That is all from me. My name is Miriam Sessa from Tui Caucus. Um, many of you know me um, who are, are in this space um, often. For those who don't know me, I'm, um, been, we've been running webinars for quite a few years and I'm really passionate about offering the space to people. And that is all from us. I'm going to hand it over to Tanya and Debbie from Malatest to introduce themselves and get us started. Kia ora. Kia ora. Yeah. Thanks, Miriam. Tēnā koutou katoa. Um, mā tātua te waka, ko uh, ngā pohi rawa ko Ngāti Rua, o ku uh, um, iwi, uh, ko Ngāti Rihia rawa ko Ngāti Rua, o ku hapū. Um, Ko mā ngaiti, rāwa ko um, taupo ki marae, um, ko emi emi te maunga, ko uh, waiti toki te awa, uh, ko tāni e speita, tōko ingoa. Um, thank you for having us today. We're um, Tania and Debbie from Malatest. Um, I just introduced myself very quickly, Tani e speita. Um, I'm a, a principal analyst here and um, really looking forward to sharing some evaluation insights with you today. I'll hand you over to Debbie to introduce herself. Kia ora, Debbie McLeod. Um, I'm one of the directors of Malatest and we've been lucky enough to work with some of you and really enjoy evaluation in the sector and so uh, really grateful to have this opportunity to talk with you today. Um, how did we come to be here? Um, Miriam invited us. We've worked with Tuanest uh, before on a, a, a big evaluation, for, a formative and process evaluation of the specialist sexual harm services. So um, really privileged to work alongside um, Ngā Taikiaki Māori and the Tauiwi Caucus. And getting to know all those members of uh, Tuanest all, all throughout the country. Um, so thank you for inviting us into your whare and sharing your mahi with us. Um, so thank you also to Miriam for inviting us back today to share with you um, some in, in, uh, evaluation bits and pieces. 
Um, I wanted to add that before March, Debbie and I would have been absolutely terrible at this uh, technical mode of engagement. And, and we may still be. But, yeah, yes, <laughs> but um, yeah, things have changed. The terrain has shifted and we feel quite at home on Zoom now. Um, but also uh, just a disclaimer that this is our first ever webinar. So um, we, we're trying our best and we, we hope that we're able to um, impart information that's useful to you. Um, yeah. So um, please do um, throughout uh, give us questions. We've got a section further down the presentation um, where we're going to ask for ideas from you. Um, we want to stress that most of the uh, theory that we're sharing today is grounded in uh, Western worldviews um, and concepts. Um, so we, while we'll talk about incorporating Kaupapa Māori and Pacific frameworks, um, this presentation is very much uh, looking at the mainstream part of evaluation um, and we will refer to the formative and process evaluations um, that we undertook for the specialist sexual harm work because many of you are really familiar with that mahi um, and uh, yes just encouraging sending those questions in throughout. So um, Today we'll talk about um, defining evaluation, what it is and what it isn't. Um, we'll think about why. Why would you evaluate something and, and the difference between evaluation and research. Um, we'll touch on uh, the most sort of frequently used types of evaluation and we'll get stuck into some logic models. Um, we'll explain to you uh, something that was not apparent to me for a very long time, which is the importance and power of really good administrative data. Um, and we'll uh, finish off talking about continuous improvement and evaluation timing. Uh, and then we'll have some time uh, for any examples that you might have of things you would like to evaluate. So, um, What's evaluation? Uh, we've got a, a nice chunky little um, definition here that, that evaluation focuses on coming to evaluative conclusions, answering specific questions to support the impl implementation, development, understanding of a project or program and what it is achieving. So um, in doing this, evaluation provides evidence to support funding decisions and budget bids. If we look at our example of the specialist sexual harm evaluation, it was a very large and complex evaluation that came out of um, the, the 2016 um, operating funding that was invested through budget 2016, and that was to design and implement new specialist sexual harm services and maintain existing services. So in order to do that, um, there, were, there were three parts to it, but we'll, we'll go into more detail about what we did later on. Um, so we wanted to evaluate the extent of the service changes and improving access for people who need the services and reduce harm, um, the changes in the services, the extent to which they achieve their aims and assess the implementation of the service development and outcomes. So um, what evaluation is not? Um, well, evaluation is different to auditing. Auditing is a compliance exercise. Um, it's um, very different to what we do, which is learning together with you. Um, market research, again, very different, and, and Debbie's worked in the market research area previously. Uh, market research, um, the kinds of questions that you would ask uh, could well be included in evaluation. Um, for example, population level awareness of your service. Um, and research we'll discuss in more detail in the next slide. Did you want to add anything about auditing and market research? Yeah, so I think, um, I mean, auditing is also a positive activity. It can also, it provides information that can strengthen what you're doing. Evaluation just goes that one step further of sort of working collaboratively and actually reaching evaluative conclusions about the effectiveness of a program. Um, market research and research are important. A lot of the data collection methods overlap with evaluation. Market research methodologies like general population surveys, et cetera, are often the key component in an evaluation exercise. For example, if you wanted to find out 
how aware people were of uh, a particular activity or service, or you wanted to um, just look at changes in something new that was being promoted, for example, a new health service or new access to a product, you might just do a survey of the general population. And uh, the main difference between research and evaluation is, is how you use the information and the questions you formulate. So both Debbie and I come from uh, research backgrounds. Um, we both worked in public health um, over, de goodness me, I think if we add it together, we're looking at 50 plus years of... <laughs> quite a lot more than that. <laughs> uh, so um, in, in the research world, you are generating new knowledge um, or you're testing hypotheses. Um, so we have qualitative, quantitative research. And if we were going to uh, look at uh, the specialist sexual harm work, if, if someone were to be doing research around this, they might ask questions like, what's the prevalence of, of sexual harm uh, or sexual violence? What are the risk factors for sexual harm behaviours? What are the impacts and how can we minimise or prevent sexual harm? Um, if we then look at evaluation, which is different, although sharing some of the same tools, um, it's more about information for decision making, for continuous improvement, and we're hanging our evaluation theory on logic models and evaluation frameworks, which we'll, we'll get a bit more stuck into in, in the following slides. But I think that's uh, probably the, the main difference is that evaluation theory uh, compared to, to research. Um, we're looking at things like, uh, for the specialist sexual harm evaluation, what changed? We've, we've got this thing that changed. How, how did that play out? Um, are the services providing effective support for clients? Um, have the expected benefits been achieved? Um, who's being reached? Who's not being reached? What are the different contexts uh, for the different services? Um, I think there's also an economic layer that you might put on top of that, which is, um, were, was this money well spent? What was the value for money? And was that uh, the best way to spend that money? Or would there have been more value for money by uh, focusing that in a different direction? And I talk about value for money, but that could be costs and benefits. It could be an economic analysis or economic evaluation. There are lots of different terms which essentially look at valuing um, the service that's being delivered. And that valuing can come from the perspective of just the, 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 the dollar costs and the dollar savings, or it can bring in community perceptions of value. So um, bringing in the more sort of intangible and difficult to measure concepts. Um, I think this is a natural break for us between just a general introduction to the difference between evaluation and research before we move on to why you might want to evaluate and how to go about it. So, Miriam, are there any questions at this point? No, not at this point, just um, lots of sharing in the chat of where people are still. So I think everyone's just warming up to your presentation, which is going really well. Keep going. <laughs> Okay, so why do you want to evaluate? And I think there are often, and probably people out there that we can't see who are saying, but I know what I do. I know what our service achieves. I can see people in front of me and I know whether we've been effective or not because I can get that immediate one-on-one -on -one feedback. And it's, it's difficult sometimes for us to convince people that evaluation will add value to what they already know. And where I think we add a lot of value is by providing that broader perspective. So yes, as service providers, you absolutely feel um, how well you're doing by immediate feedback or uh, just whether people come back to you or not. But what you don't know is who you're not reaching. I mean, how effectively you may be reaching people because particularly some uh, individuals, whānau uh, population groups aren't going to necessarily give you feedback. And we definitely know that responding to whānau feedback and feedback informed treatment or feedback informed practice is still a developing thing and it can be quite um, 
difficult, I think, to switch to that way of working. And I can say from Tanya and myself's perspective, we're nervous about the evaluation that you'll be providing <laughs> at the end of today. So particularly then evaluation is also useful for you know, just your business as usual, working out how you can strengthen it, but it's also particularly useful if you want to do something different. So you've been working in a service, you've had an idea or you've identified a gap or you've thought, look, there's something here that is missing, there's something we really need to do. You might want to trial that as a provider, you might want to set something up where you say, okay, I'm going to introduce this new service or this new way of working. You might decide you're going to do it with a randomized group, you might decide you're just going to do it with everybody, but you want to know, you want to think, um, objectively about is this better or is it not better and particularly as a service provider you will want to be gathering evidence if it is better to um, inform a funding bid so there's nothing stronger than saying look we've got this uh, service model idea we've identified this gap we've built into our usual practice a way of uh, responding to that gap We've done a very small pilot study. Here's our evidence. This is supporting our bid. It makes everything a lot more powerful if you can do that. And the main, one of the main things we want to say today is evaluation is not difficult. We're talking about a big sort of multi-layer evaluation with the specialist sexual harm service evaluation. But evaluation can be really simple. Uh, and Miriam's going to talk later about evaluation of a webinar series. I mean, it's very linear, it's very simple. Um, so just thinking about that whole spectrum all the time. And just here I want to acknowledge, I've put a link into the slides which you'll get, which is a link to a, um, an evaluation overview book. That's a, a sort of basic outline of evaluation that was developed for Superu, but, uh, by Superu, but is now in the DPMC website and this little graphic is from that and it's got a lot of the sort of evaluation 101 information in it uh, and so you'll, you'll have that link that you can go and have a look at uh, but it, it is useful in showing the different or the breadth of people from providers, funders, project managers, policy makers uh, to program managers who find evaluation useful and would would welcome evaluation findings. So there are lots of different types of evaluation. The strongest from our perspective, and, and this is our perspective, is when evaluation is collaborative, when your evaluators are part of the program or a new service right from the very start. Bringing evaluators in at the end is often a bit late because you might not be collecting the right information, you might not have thought about the right things. Um, we find that government is more and more uh, putting out uh, requests for proposals for evaluation that sits alongside pilot service delivery. And we find that we, the pilot sites that are delivering services also welcome evaluation being there from the start because we can bring our perspective. Often we hear that the questions we ask them that are evaluation questions are actually really helpful for them in setting up their service and thinking about things to monitor as they go through. But just the, the main types, developmental evaluation is really right at the very start and is probably closer to research than anything else. It provides information to, to develop a policy service delivery or a project and probably often includes a really in-depth and thorough literature review, uh, what's happening at the moment, um, what do we know, how, and it might be some uh, interviews with key people, key stakeholders to understand how current services do or don't meet their needs in order to develop something different. So once you've developed that new idea or product, a formative evaluation is, is, it sits along inside the service in that early stage to say, okay, how are you going and setting it up? Like, let's uh, think about the different challenges that you're having, what's working well. Evaluation can be really powerful at that point if there's more than one pilot site because we can bring people together and say, look, you're all 
finding these challenges, bring along the funder and they can say, oh yes, look, we need to do something, or there's these challenges are the direct result of a system issue that might be around funding or just access or workforce shortages. So the formative phase is a bit of a troubleshooting phase. You're setting something up, how well is it going and how can we help solve those problems now right at the start rather than getting to the end of a, a two year pilot and saying, well, everything turned to custard because uh, there was no ability to uh, refer people on or we weren't getting people as a service, we weren't having people referred to us in the right or the right people that we were trying to reach. Process evaluation then says, okay, well, it's formed, it's set in place, your service, you've got the policies in place, you've got the, the practice models. So now we're going to track and monitor what's happening. So this is where we might be coming to you and saying, look, you've got this wonderful admin data in your systems. Can we look at how we present that and use it to look at who you're reaching, compare it maybe to your population and say, well, are you actually, who are you not reaching? Uh, are you reaching the target group? Um, and what are you starting to achieve? So you're at this stage of a process evaluation, often starting to look at early outcomes because people were moving through the service all of this time. Uh, this phase would also be helpful. Um, it's also helpful to include whānau voices in this. And I think it's, it's worth pausing briefly to talk about the value of hearing whānau voices and how we often hear or as evaluators, or you know, we're, we're nervous about linking you with, um, with our whānau because they, they're vulnerable and it, it might be difficult for them to talk. I guess we'd really strongly always make the point to avoid gatekeeping that people, some people won't want to talk to evaluators. Some people gain a huge amount from being able to reflect on their journeys and say, look back on what we've achieved. Um, when Tanya's got an example from a recent evaluation. Yes, I, I um, had the pleasure of touching base um, with a, a young woman um, who'd been part of the service for a number of years and, and faced a lot of challenges and struggles and um, feedback that being part of the evaluation and reflecting on the kinds of questions that we were asking, not about her trauma or about the, the, the personal things in her life, absolutely about the service and her experience of the service, um, gave her space to really reflect on how far she'd come and how awesome she was. So then the, the outcome stage of the evaluation, which is, so what has been produced who's been reached, spelled in an unusual way, sorry about that, um, and what difference it's made, and should it be continued? So the outcomes phase pulls on all of the information to date, but it will usually include a qualitative and a quantitative component. So particularly if there's an economic evaluation, which is hanging off the, the outcomes evaluation, you also hear the words impact evaluation um, mentioned. So you might be wondering what's the difference between an impact evaluation and an outcomes evaluation. So both are trying to look and sum up what have you produced, what have you achieved. But to under the, the impact evaluation focuses more on so what difference did that intervention or service make as opposed to people just um, being supported in, the, in a business as usual way or not being supported at all. And impacts are really difficult often to answer because they need some form of comparison group. Now in the specialist sexual harm um, service delivery space, obviously you're not going to randomize people to having support or not having support or minimize the kind of support you provide. So the focus is a bit more on outcomes and looking at population level change. And really that brings into play the role of logic models and how they help in making that evaluative argument about what has been achieved. So I think um, this is probably another natural break to see if uh, Miriam has received any questions. Now we've got a, quite a quiet chat at the moment, um, but I 
I think what what I'm observing in myself is it's some great framing for me of you know some really good building blocks that hopefully more questions will come up later so you're doing really well thank you cool so you've used the term building blocks which is um, really what a logic model is so logic models are a way of putting together all those building blocks that help you to achieve that overarching outcome. So they're very, very, by definition, logic models are very, very logical. They really just say, how are you funding it? What are the inputs? What are you gonna do? What are you going to produce? And what has going, how are you going to know what has changed as a result? So they can be as simple as that. Uh, and for a, for a simple project or service, um, as I mentioned before, you might say like the input is you're going to increase um, staffing after hours or something like that. So you want to know, okay, what are you going to do? You're going to make sure that you've got the workforce available, that you've got the right safety structures in place so that the support for that person, that they'll be able to call on or refer um, as required um, in that new time slot that you might be offering services. And then your outputs are going to be, so how many people did we see in that after hours, that new after hours service? Was it useful or did the person, did our counsellor sit there twiddling their thumbs? And then the outcomes, well, you're hoping that actually you did see a lot of people because your rationale for putting the service in in the first place was that you'd identified a gap. So you're, you're going to say, okay, well, these are the kinds of people that we reached in those in that new after hours session or new digital session or new whatever you wanted. And then what changed as a result, you will probably for a sort of a simple one, um, you might ideally have some wellbeing tool or some way of measuring outcomes that you've incorporated and you'll make some decisions about, do we want to continue doing that? So this is a, a little bit more, it's not actually a logic model, but it's it's just a framework for a logic model. And it was the framework we used for the evaluation of specialist sexual harm services. And it was interesting because it was had system level, provider level, and it also had service user levels component to the evaluation. So we wanted to emphasize the system level issues for that. So we looked at leadership and management workforce, enabling systems and tools and collaborations and partnerships. And we looked at the activities that were wanted to be, um, that were aimed to be achieved or delivered there. And then we looked at the outputs from each and how those all contribute to that sort of overarching um, outcome. And this is where the building blocks bit comes in. So for anything you do, uh, anything that government funds, what you're most interested in are the outcomes and the impacts. I mean, you're, you're doing evaluation because you want to know that what you're evaluating makes a difference and is important. And the higher up we go in that um, blue triangle is sort of, it's emphasizing how important it is, like particularly at a government level, funder level, what's most important is understanding the program's achievements. Okay, the, the activities and the inputs, they're important because if the building blocks aren't in place, so if we find that the program actually needed to have, if it aimed to um, reduce barriers to access to a service, but actually, the, the way the mechanism to reduce those barriers was never put in place properly, i.e. the partnerships or the referral pathways, then there's no, no hope of achieving the outcomes. So in your earlier stages of your evaluation, your formative or your process evaluation, you might have identified that there were some bricks missing from your building blocks and gone back to try and remedy that before you were passing um, an evaluative judgment about the effectiveness of a program. What you absolutely don't want to do is reach an evaluative conclusion that says, well, that wasn't worthwhile. That was a whole lot of money for nothing. When actually what was wrong was something way down at the activities level 
that you identified and that's why you want to think about evaluation right from the start and putting it in place alongside everything you do. The green um, triangle is the reverse and that it shows how easy or difficult it is to measure what's happening and to attribute changes to your, um, your new initiative. So it's very easy to count activities and it's very easy to count outputs. It's very easy to say, well, we reached 50 people or and describe who those people were, which is, I guess, what has um, underpinned a lot of reporting that providers are required to do, where we often hear, oh, we get asked to count widgets because widgets can be counted and they're easy to count. But the thing that everyone wants to know is what difference did this make? How did we do that? And that's much, much harder to do. Sometimes your high level um, outcome is not measurable and it's aspirational and that's fine as long as you've got some outcomes that are measurable. What we sometimes say is, is we get asked to evaluate, pro evaluate programs where you know, broadly speaking, the aim is to make the world a better place. Like it's so unmeasurable. Um, so part of developing a logic model is to sit down with the with the policy makers, with the providers, with all of the key stakeholders and say, what can we measure? Because evaluation is about measurement and you can't reach conclusions about the outcomes unless you've got a way of measuring outcomes. So in planning your initiative, you need to think about so what does success look like? What am I trying to do and how am I going to measure it? On measuring, I had a little think this morning because uh, I'm try I was trying to think how to articulate to you, um, Lens, the importance of who's doing the measuring and where they're coming from. And I remembered um, quite some time ago um, doing some work on, which wasn't evaluation, it was research. I used to do a lot of lung function testing um, back in the day. And the, the predicted values for lung function tests, um, once I looked in the literature, were um, pretty much based on uh, white men, European men. So um, when we would be doing lung function testing out in, in the world, in the communities, um, with us, Pacifica, with uh, Māori, with women, um, the, the predictive values didn't always work out so well um, with, with people's baseline lung function. And it's the same when you're measuring an evaluation. And it's so important to take um, context, the context of communities, of whānau, of individuals, into every aspect of, of evaluation. Um, so when we Think about that context, it's um, culture including ethnicity, sexuality, um, religion, ability, um, and just, just the diversity of, of the world views of the people um, who are part of the service, of the workers, of the whānau that they support. Um, and of course, in Aotearoa, New Zealand, Te Tiriti o Waitangi um, it underpins policy and practice. And um, evaluation sh should have that equity lens. Um, the service should have the equity lens. There are amazing kaupapa Māori and Pacific frameworks that we can use um, when, when we're doing an evaluation. Um, there are really wonderful tools for measuring well-being. Um, so it's very important that we acknowledge that wider context. And uh, when we looked at the specialist sexual harm evaluation, there were all these different providers working in different communities, different areas, doing things very differently. So how to use a logic model to plan an evaluation in your service. So I think your, your big key questions that you start with are knowing what you want to evaluate and why, and knowing that there's evidence or a theory of change or a rationale that sits under your approach and understanding the cultural context of the new initiative or service you're going to develop. And I'm just going to skip over to the next slide because most of that is also on there. So in putting together a logic model, 
you have to work through these steps as we've seen. So the inputs, you're going to think about what was invested. And the evaluation question there was often, and was it enough? Um, were there any restraints or limitations to what you were able to do because of the, um, the resourcing? The activities, a part of evaluation is just describing what it was, what was the initiative, how was it rolled out, um, who was the target group, how, were they, how will they be reached, um, what was delivered to them, and then what challenges were met and how could they be improved. And then the outputs, looking again, well actually when, we, when it came to the crunch and we got to that point, what did we deliver and how did it differ from what we intended to deliver? Who did we reach and were they the group that we intended to reach? And what difference did we make? Who was better off as a, as a result? And then the impact evaluation we talked about, if you have a comparison group, how do we know that what we did made a difference? And you can answer that question also using qualitative data, of course, but a combination of qualitative and quantitative data is, is often more powerful. We've got some, um, on, the, on the right of that slide, we've got some information about potential data sources for your evaluation. They don't need to be expensive, they don't need to be complicated. Uh, your main and most important source of data is your administrative data, and I'll talk about that on the next slide. Your, you will want to hear the voices of all the people involved, so you'll want to have some interviews with the key stakeholders, people who are delivering the service, you want to just hear their perspectives about what's happening. You might want to have something like a survey, a feedback form from, um, from clients. You need to make sure if you're doing that, that you can demonstrate some way that you're acting on these or giving it back or, I mean, ethically making sure that if you're taking people's time that it's, you're giving them value for that. Case studies can be very powerful and they might be case studies of a service or a new initiative or they might be case studies of a whānau journey. And then the, the end user, the client whānau community voices are really important and depending on the population you're trying to reach or the community uh, would emphasise the importance of kaupapa Māori methodologies or Pacific frameworks, etc. Did you want to add anything, Tanya? Just really um, the importance of connection and um, for services, how, how they connect with other services or others in their community. Um, so com community we can be really useful um, and yes. so interfaces. Yes. Yeah. So administrative data. And what we mean by that is your case management system if you're a service provider. The, the data you routinely collect is your most valuable resource for evaluation. And I think making that mental switch from using your data on a one-on-one -on -one case management or a one-to-many case management where you're just recording what you need in front of you to saying, this is a hugely, hugely valuable resource for evaluation, for strengthening your service, for talking about what you're doing, reporting on anything at all, really. It is the most useful and cost-effective resource you have. And you hear people talk about unit record data. So that is looking at it line by line, having a good structure where you can export data about every single client. Now, to people were services that we talked to around the specialist sexual harm had quite a variety of different case management systems, and that would be totally true of NGOs as a whole. Some people are using hard copy files, which makes it very difficult to use admin data in an evaluative way. Some have systems that are used for case management, but don't have very good exporting or reporting um, for functions or facilities, or they have them, but people aren't quite sure how to use them. So to maximise the usefulness of your system, your, your system provider, you need to really push them to make sure that you have a good way of extracting data and being able to develop customised reporting in the way that you want to. 
you need to work with your teams to make sure that you consistently record data. I mean, when we first go into a service and we look at something basic like age, ethnicity, we often find that that's only recorded for half of clients. Um, so completeness and consistency of coding, so that if you're wanting to look at intensity of support or the way that people are supported, having some consistent way that everybody uses to record what's been, what, what has actually happened, what's been delivered to the client. And then our sort of final, I guess, slide before discussion and thinking about your examples is just thinking about evaluation and evaluation timing as part of continuous improvement. And that's where you're doing it yourself or even if you have someone else come and do it, but it, it, it's part of, it's woven into a continuous improvement process um, within your service or your practice or whatever you're doing. Um, and we push, really emphasise what we've emphasised all the way through, that evaluation should be collaborative. A collaborative evaluation really enhances that continuous improvement element. There is a school of thought uh, that evaluation should be pure and the evaluator should be totally separate from the service provider. We absolutely disagree with that and I think there's, a, there's more of a shift now towards evaluation being a collaborative exercise um, where the evaluator comes along as early as possible and if you're thinking of a pilot that the evaluator is actually very useful in terms of planning pilots and planning service delivery and then helping you all the way through. So that's uh, the, the next slide is about your example so a natural break there for, for questions. Yeah, we have a couple of um, <clears throat> quite good questions that have come through. Um, and the first, the first one has uh, quite a few questions in it, so I'll, I'll um, break it down with you. So I'll say it as a whole and then we can split them out if that works for you. Um, so how do you as program evaluators assist in translating results slash outcomes into more effective policy change or program improvement that actually benefit whānau and community? Um, do you think this is actually part of your role and where does sustainability tie into your work? So those are quite a nice meaty question to tie us all into everything that you've said so far. And a re really good question and a really important one in that it comes back to the ethics of taking people's time up with evaluation if those findings aren't going to be used. We have found over probably the last decade there's been quite a shift in government's attitude to releasing evaluation findings and now we find it would be really unusual for the findings of evaluation not to be released on websites. Now that comes directly back to how do we assist in translating the results and we absolutely see that that's our role. We build in uh, ways of summarising information back to providers, ways of producing or presenting information that works for policymakers. So we would usually have a findings workshop before we produce the final report where we discuss those implications. Often we push to have a joint work or joint workshops all the way through evaluation that bring in uh, the government funder, because because I'm saying the government funder because probably three quarters of our work is evaluating pilots funded by government. We bring the funder in and we bring them in with the service providers and sit them all around a table and sometimes it, it provides a different kind of forum for discussion and it can be a really effective way of sharing information, talking about system level barriers. And then the other group that results need to be translated and reported back to and the circle closed is Farnon Community who took part. And we would work with the service providers about the best way to do that. We've produced um, you know, nice little pamphlets that summarise things in an appropriate way for appropriate communities or we've done community hui or presentations. Uh, I guess we could acknowledge the importance and that we do that, 
but that the way that we do that would be um, developed in partnership with the service that we were evaluating. Uh, sustainability is, is a real bugbear, I think, in terms of sometimes we are evaluating pilot programs, we're evaluating pilots that have been funded by government because they had a bit of money left over and they've got this pot and they can use it to test something out. And providers do that, they put it in place, the evaluation shows it's positive, but there's no money for ongoing funding. I mean, we identify that as a risk that is beyond our control. Um, all I can say is that learnings often from those, we do see them flow through to um, budget bids that lead to a more sustainable service, but totally acknowledge that the absolute frustration of small pilots. And I suppose that also ties into the commitment um, from any funders, whether it's philanthropic or government, to ensure that there is resource um, for evaluation embedded within, that that's something they recognise and they're actually willing to fund as well. Mm -hmm. um, having all of that come in. Sorry, uh, Tanya, do you have something to add? Just uh, a, a link that we failed to provide um, on our final slide. Um, if anyone wanted to look at MSD's website, our A3 presentation of the uh, process evaluation um, gives an example of, of a, a more engaging and accessible um, form of the evaluation for people to read. Not everyone wants to sit down with a great big report. Some people do, and thank you to those people. <laughs> but, but often, um, yeah, people want something very, very um, precise, concise, engaging, and uh, we have an example of that on MSD's website. Uh, Tanya, uh, well, when Tanya talked about the context in which we're doing evaluation, because a lot of our work is funded by government or the evaluation is funded by an external party and if it's government they are often doing it to provide information to treasury and information to ministers and government agencies it's a very western type of framework so we try to straddle the gap between the kinds of information and reporting and contexts that our providers and whānau might be working in and how to message that and translate it into a report that actually provides the information that government and treasury need. So we do produce different products, different end products to try and <clears throat> straddle that gap. And an area that I think is, is, is still a gap in New Zealand and still needs developing is, is really thinking about evaluation with different lenses. Um, so kaupapa Māori lens, like what, what would that look like? What would a sort of a, um, a, a, an equivalent to a logic model? We can, we use a Western model, but we bring in measures and indicators and questions that reflect our different communities. But it, evaluation is still a developing discipline. It's not something that's been around or done well for a long time. And uh, I think... Oh, I left here to go and work in Canada in 2010 and at that point evaluation was really poorly developed in New Zealand compared with North America. I think we've caught up but I think that we have also the opportunity to provide leadership in um, a kaukapa Māori perspectives on evaluation and different perspectives and yeah there's some, there's some lots of thinking still to be done. Absolutely. And as you're as you're talking, what I was thinking is, um, I wonder what a couple my approach to to treasury would look like as well. <laughs> often, you know, these things are dictated by um, what do the bean counters need to be? How how are they being informed and how are they prioritising work? So it'd be like let's pitch it big and broad of how could uh, how could the whole of our society look like transformed? So and how could evaluation as a stream contribute to that? So, which ties in really well to our next question, um, which I, I kind of feel is um, a potentially an invite for another uh, webinar, which is, can you tell us more about Copa Māori and Pacific frameworks and tools for measuring wellbeing with um, specifically around sexual violence, if you have any? So partly that comes back to going through your logic model and thinking about what you want to achieve 
And what we heard in the sexual violence context a lot when we said, what does success look like, was that people described wairua and they described, you just can see that difference. And there are tools out there. We uh, have been using uh, Hua Oranga, which is based on Te Whare Tapawha, and it looks at the four domains of well-being and asks people to self-assess where they are so you can look at those different aspects of holistic well-being. Uh, under, underpinning a lot of pilots that are sitting in that health social sector space is well-being. And there are the, the child and youth well-being strategy has uh, on the website, uh, DPMC website, it has defined some domains for young people that really flow through to domains for the rest of the population as well. They've also specified some indicators, so specific things around do people feel safe, do people feel loved, do they feel they belong. Um, so there's a breadth of different framework, some which are used in data collection and some which are frameworks for thinking about how you would report and analyse your findings. So narrowing down what is the difference that you think that you're going to make and what does success look like is the first step in identifying those tools. But the gap, the step that makes it always really, really difficult for evaluators is you can have the best tool in the world, but if your frontline staff won't use that tool and won't make it part of a conversation and consistently use it at regular intervals, then you may as well not bother. I can testify to that. Having been a, a team leader in a service, if um, finding the tools that actually the staff will use is really, really important. And in particular, that connection around that it's useful for the client, not for the, not for measuring the outcome, that it's actually they can see the purpose and the usefulness of it um, in having a dialogue with the person that they're trying to support. Otherwise, it, it's just out of sync with everyone. Um, but also the follow up of, um, and it kind of ties in, uh, some of us something quite practical around improving client feedback forms that we could use as an, exa as an example. Mm -hmm. um, and that could help us as well because I'm thinking there's lots of different ways you can also get feedback and um, and maybe we could explore some of that. It's building, building that feedback, it's being a mature enough organisation to accept the feedback and build that into your practice. And we're saying that as we are going to maturely look at the results of the evaluation of the session and build it into our practice. <laughs> And, and I suppose okay. I suppose the other piece of that um, question is also ensuring, like if we think of a service delivery and the client feedback form, it's going back to what you're saying of what does your logic model say around what your service should is trying to achieve and then mm. how does your um, feedback form capture that information? So we're not trying yeah. to capture something different that we're not trying to achieve. So should we try and use... Um, try and use that as a practical example or? Um, sorry, using developing client feedback tool? Yeah. Yeah. As no. I, I'm kind of looking in the, in the chat that more people are coming from that kind of space of the world of client, client yep. delivery than, um, than webinar delivery, <laughs> which was my example. <laughs> but that could be a useful kind of model of what's, what's happening in terms of a frontline service, whether, whether mm. it's an edu like a therapeutic service or an education service, how could we help shape the feedback form that ca helps capture our data? Yeah, and I guess the, the, there are a lot of feedback forms out there, a lot which have, um, they're so high level that they can't really be, they're not useful or used, like are you satisfied? How satisfied are you with, your visit today is sort of, uh, if you're providing a service that people don't have to go to, then you're not probably going to be getting the feedback from the right people. Um, but just thinking through client feedback, so the first question would be, 
are you what are you wanting feedback on is it your business as usual model or is it something different or is it a specific aspect of your um, I mean your your referral pathways the your, the culture of your organization I'd recommend that you think about what you want to almost like a sort of an action evaluation action research model where you think about what you might want to focus on and change because if you have a, a, a client feedback form that's got uh, 20 questions in it or 10 questions in it they're very high level you're not really going to um, respond or make changes quickly to those and sometimes it might be that you know, amongst your team you think okay so what do we want to what do we most want to know about what we're doing and it could be um, it could be quite practical things so it could be about um, you know waiting times or how you feel about the way that you're greeted by the receptionist um, we often hear from clients that the the um, how do we want them to experience the way that we interact with them? So what we often hear from clients is that they want to feel that they've been listened to, that they've been respected. And that, not judged. And not judged. Mm. So and that someone's put forward um, also that it's important to capture the voice of those who didn't or not using the service. And yeah. do you have any ideas on like how do you do that? Because that's a really interesting, is that through your community engagement of, why are you not going to this service? What do they do? Oh. Um, yep, first of all is probably having a look at who you're reaching and comparing their demographics to your target group and or to your population. And if you find that you're not reaching, for example, Pacifica populations, then you might want to go to um, local Pacific communities and just explore a little bit about what any potential barriers might be to coming along to your service. So understanding who you're trying to reach and understanding who you're not reaching is um, the first part of trying to look at how to seek feedback from that group. You could try very hard to reach people who, um, I mean, often we hear about do not attend, missed appointments, like why, to understand why that is. And sometimes that requires an independent person saying, look, on behalf of the service, confidentially want to look at what the barriers were or why you didn't attend or why you were referred but never made an appointment. Um, that sometimes um, providers can give us insights into those things as well, especially with the DNAs, that, um, that there was a mum that has four kids and she can't possibly get to the hospital at yeah. eight in the morning. And responding to that by, I mean, we did one nice little project around um, where there was a, a Kaifina role put in place to bridge that distance between a, a sort of a general practice context and people who needed intensive support for diabetes but weren't attending appointments. Mm. So they, they identified that there was a gap, that people weren't being reached it was difficult to change the um, the health model, so the, the way that the general practice model, like there were all sorts of reasons why it was difficult to change that. But what they could do is put in a new service, which was a, a Kaifina role, who went out and engaged with um, Fano. And we had some lovely, lovely comments in the feedback that was we went out and talked to those Fano, and we had one person who said, Oh, if it's the Pākehā nurse coming, I just hide. Um, you know, I pretend I'm not at home. Um, but if it's the Kaifina, he just keeps on banging and I know he's not going to go away, so I have to let him in. <laughs> yeah. so. And you wouldn't be able to do that. In a Sorry, we just missed that. Well, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Um, that will be very hard to capture in an evaluation form. That, that conversation of why did one thing happen, you know, and the value of getting, having a process of external evaluation and, got, and having someone external to the service ask those questions. Mm. That someone yeah. Can, yeah. Feel comfortable having that level of dialogue of um, that, you know, they might not feel comfortable 
talking elsewhere. It ties in um, an interesting question um, someone has is does process evaluation, um, sorry, is process evaluation what you recommend as the best way to evaluate a Fano journey towards achieving their goals? So um, I'll let you answer that. Um. Yes, I guess it is. Um, well, try to answer that. Process evaluation would include whānau journeys, but you might, depending on what you want to understand from that whānau journey, it might also be an outcomes evaluation. Uh, it's it's more um, capturing a whānau journey or or understanding a whānau journey is more of a a, a methodology, a, like you'd be building in probably your case notes, your admin data, hearing whānau voices, but thinking about going back to the logic model before saying, is this a process evaluation? Is What is the question that you want to answer about the whānau journey? So you'd go up through the logic model and say, well, look, what are the activities? What did we do with that whānau? Are you doing something different with them? That is what you want to um, understand, in which case you might also do a formative evaluation where you sat down with Fano and said, look, you know, we're, we're thinking about how we can best support you. Uh, and you developed a, a process or a way, and then a process evaluation would enable you to track how you were going along that journey with Fano. And then the outcomes component would be, well, what did what, what was achieved by that Fano and how did we support them to achieve that? And so it's it would be potentially all elements of an evaluation. So it comes back to thinking about why do you want to track that Fano journey? What is it that you want to know about it? Great. Um, and I think it's great to have the kind of the, the journey of the development of evaluation as well as the development of the service kind of in the picture and going what information is useful to capture when um, mm. is, is what I'm really hearing strongly. And um, there's another question which is more around Kaupapamari research and evaluation frameworks. Um, is there anything that you would recommend when doing this kind of work in sexual violence? So what processes are important to adhere to in particular for this mahi? And that's a very big question, which um, if there's any kind of, you know, Googling words or um, suggestions of, you know, suggested areas to look into. I think in our formative report, uh, that, that does touch on that area. Um, I can't direct you to the exact part in the report, but um, yes. Maybe and I think if you were... The email that we send out? Yes, our emails are there. No, yep. sorry. Um, oh, we can add the link yep. yeah, to the report. But I'd also say that, I mean, it is a really big question and it's one that would, I think, in a, in a specific sector, there are kaupapa Māori, in your sector, there are kaupapa Māori providers. It's, it's probably it's sitting down and saying, well, look, what frameworks? Are you using and what do you find are useful and then thinking about how they could be incorporated into an evaluative context because right. we as evaluators we sort of we can think about us as sort of you know um, as the guides and and signposting the direction but we always feel the people who are delivering the service you're the experts so we can help overlay um, an evaluation framework but you you know your service, you know what success looks like, you know what the questions are and the challenges you're reaching. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll, we've got one, sorry, my voice seems to be coming up for you two. Um, we've got one last question for the day, which is, um, what are your thoughts on the funnel order outcomes, if you do have any? Um, and... For everyone else, I have put the link for talking about evaluation for our feedback forms. Um, so do feel free to give us feedback on today's session. Um, I'll put it again in the link in the chat. So Fauna Order um, is a well-developed model. It provides a good framework for evaluation. Sometimes you, you will also need to think about what are the specific measures and indicators that we can put in place under that framework. 
and how can we align our data collection tools with it. But Fanora is always a really good place to start. Right. So it's, it's, you know, it's, it's often moving from that sort of high level sort of outcomes down to thinking about what are the specific measures and indicators. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll wrap today up here. Um, and today's been really useful and for me, um, and I, I was seeing other people in, um, in the chat saying this around the usefulness of having really con concrete building blocks, because often if you don't have a background in evaluation, it can be quite daunting navigating all the different theories and all the different tools and all the different information. So having some guidance around um, how to do this simply, which I really enjoyed you saying before that it actually can be quite simple. Um, and we can keep it, you know, we, we don't have to make it too complex, but spending time, what I really took home is spending time of thinking, where are we going? What, what are we trying to do? What, how are we trying to do this um, is really important. And my experience also of working alongside you is for me, the values alignment between evaluators and services is really important. So you kind of busting the, the trend and going, actually evaluation is a collaborative and not this distanced um, clinical model of someone coming in and observing you was where I felt our values really aligned um, and um, felt really uh, excited about working alongside you actually um, over the time that you evaluated um, that were in that journey with lots of our frontline services. And I think that's a really powerful reflection of no matter which piece of the puzzle we're working along, the values alignment is really important. Mm -hmm. of, um, that we're all there trying to do a similar thing, bringing our different tools and different um, knowledges to the table. So really thank you both. Um, and yeah, really excited to use some of the things that you talked about today to strengthen my evaluation of, um, of all sorts of different pieces for Tornes. So thank you. Um, are there any, just seeing um, lots of thank you so much, really appreciated your time. Um, some people saying that was great linked, good research, thank you so much. Great presentation. Is there any last um, comments from both of you to wrap us up today? Um, just thank you very much. I was frightened this morning. <laughs> I thought this would be really harrowing, but it's been a pleasure. And yeah, yeah. thank um, you. Okay. My last words are, it, it, it is simple. You know, I can't overemphasize that it can be simple. Keep your admin data, push your providers to make sure that you can use your admin data for self-reflection, evaluation. And thank you for the opportunity. We do have the final slide with some oh, links we do. on it. We just have That's some it. links on the final slide, which you'll get. Um, so ANZIA is the New Zealand Evaluation, Aotearoa New Zealand Evaluation Society, and that's the link to the sort of um, Evaluation 101 uh, book. Great. Um, and this is just chat. There's someone who's saying that they're keen on further webinars from both of you. So oh, thank you. <laughs> we'll, we'll try and have a chat and see when we can bring you back, because I agree, I think this is an area we can all do with more information. Um, more information about how to do this well. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I, I sincerely thank both of you for being here. It's been a pleasure. I'm glad it's not been a harrowing experience because we try and have fun in our, in our webinars. Um, and hopefully everyone enjoyed it. And we'll close today with a karakia. Well, um, wishing you all to go off well in your, in your everyday activity and um, really acknowledging everyone online like you're here because you, you want to also figure out how to do this better. Mm. And amongst your busy work, really acknowledging most of us on the front line, most of the people on the front line have incredibly busy lives. Um, so yeah, keep up the good work and we'll close and we'll wish you all well. Unihia, unihia, unihia ki te uru tapunui, kia wātia, kia māma, te nā te tinana, te wairua i te ara takata, ko i ara e rongo whakairia ki ki runga, kia tīna, tīna, huie tai. Kia everyone, go well. Ka kite anō. Kite.